I am reading, speaking, what follows in the evening time of February 9th <clears throat> in central Florida, a few miles from the seacoast. I greet all who will be listening to this address on February 19th, as I understand, in Notre Dame, Indiana. Some of you perhaps know that I have contributed a large body of poetic work to the store of modern literature, and that at a point in my career as a poet, I made an end to the growth of that work. I have said in the preface to a recently published selection of my poems that I judge my poems to be things of the first water as poetry. I do not think that they failed as poetry. I think that poetry fails. As to the standing of my poetic work in the world of literary fortune, I believe that after a while the sorry treatment it has received in that world will have interest as a historical curiosity. The treatment consists, on the one hand, of extensive use of my poetic work by poets, young and older, as a commodity in the public domain for the enrichment of their work in dignities of diction, and the elevation of it with higher than the usual concept of the nature of poetic content. On the other hand, there has been increasing resort in the field of literary jurisdiction to a policy varying from reduction to utter elimination of honoring of my contribution to the poetic substance of modern literature. A look into the histories of modern literature and anthologies of modern poetry will verify this. The general very limited, decreasing acquaintance with my poetic work <clears throat> impedes perception of the uses to which it has been and continues to be put by poets. The poets themselves who make use of it do so in the privacy of their personal poetic workshops, or if they refer to the assistance they have extracted from my poetic work, they speak of it as an influence, a term that repel, repels accusation of their having done anything literarily illegitimate. I touch on these matters because they have bearing on the subject of poetry, the first of the two subjects on which I have chosen to address you, and on my qualifications of experience for doing so from the point of view from which I shall be speaking. In addition to my ideas on the failure of poetry, I shall be incidentally exposing my thought on the literary environment in which those who are moved to enter into the practice of poetry are perforce enveloped. Judging myself to be one who, as a poet, fulfilled the honorable requisites of poetry to an extreme, I feel competent to comment intimately on the nature of poetry and on the character of the literary environment of poetic performance. It seems to me owed to my listeners that I should make it initially clear that I regard this environment in its personal, its moral composition as differentiated from the traditional, the philosophic or religious spirit of dedication to poetry as an area full of behavior as to poetry and being a poet or a professional student of poetry, unworthy on the basis of simple human requisites of honorableness, of that which is of a noble order in the historic conception of poetry and correspondent practice of it. That is, I think, that for an understanding of the case of poetry in these times in relation to the general history of poetry as one of the spiritually higher human pursuits, care must be taken against moral indulgence of what dutiful conscience would reject in the ordinary human environment just because its placement is literary. <coughs> I shall now draw from a long consideration of poetry of the title, The Failure of Poetry, written for a book of po poetry, material for which I have been assembling for many years. The date of this text from which I read is from 1965 to 1976. I string together for you chosen passages of it. First comes a very brief summary of my reason for renouncing poetry. <clears throat> 
pronounced poetry as disappointing the hopes it excites as seemingly the way of perfect human utterance or articulate truth. My renunciation includes a rejection of the authoritative character automatically attaching to the poet role as that of persons gifted with special powers, fitting them to be representative spokesmen for the rest of humanity as unequal in capability to the finest forms of human expressiveness. Some human beings do seem to incline naturally to the role of poet, and there is requisite for the role a skill of language that relatively few human beings have at ready state in them. But I think that the call to the role that strikes upon people and reverberates in their responsive breasts is in its primary nature a call to their natural human inclination to rejoice in the powers of language. This is reinforced by the appeal of the prospect of exercising the powers of poetry. And there is beyond question in that appeal the attraction of opportunities for the exercise of personal powers. But while poets are corrupted by passions of power, it is a flaw in poetry itself that causes it to fail. Human beings have had in poetry a course of action in which experimental attempts at remedying certain deficiencies in their ordinary life could be made. The poets making these attempts on behalf of all, theoretically at least. Poetry still has the status of something human beings can do or have done for them about something in which they ordinarily suffer lack <coughs> or disappointment that may remove the lack or nullify the disappointment or, if it will not do this much, will afford the pleasure of imagining the possibility of it. It will be helpful for an understanding of the point of view from which I speak here, if I distinguish at the earliest between the two categories of consideration into which, as I know poetry, everything pertaining to it falls. These categories I call craft and creed. In every poem there is, it being a poem requires that there be unremitting attention to craft. As a piece of work of words combination, a poem is craft and to an extent, or rather in a way, impossible with a piece of work of words combination of the prose order. The words have had to be fitted together into a compact, unalterable unity. It is a poem just because it must not be, it is not meant to be taken mentally apart, as can be done with an ordinary passage of words combination without damage to its effect. A poem is supposed to be apprehended from one word to another in continuous instantaneity as a perfect whole. In the aspect a poem has as craft, it offers itself as perfect in verbal workmanship. This, of course, is not all that makes a poem. But where another would say there is the emotional circumstance or the poetic scheme of associations or simply the poetic subject, I say there is, besides the craft, the creed. Creed in poetry is the belief that there is an ideal condition of the human personality characterized by complete awareness, complete articulateness, completely intelligent liberation of spirit from the gross physical preoccupations incidental to human existence, and that the condition is realizable in poems as nowhere else, anything close to it seeming realized elsewhere, <coughs> being called poetic. The effects of the realized condition for the poet and the participant audience constitute by the creed a peculiar state of being in which there is suspension of the pettier life values and a grand sense of things suffuses the being and moves the understanding. Implicit in the creed is the importance of words in the fulfillment of the potentiality of attaining to and existing for a time timelessly in this state. This poetic state is conceived to be at a height of removal from the ordinary mixed condition of the human personality at which the emotions become purified, the thinking energies harmonized, and the whole being transformed into a vibrantly articulate intelligence 
is vested in words of an eternal truth value. <coughs> Without the element of creed, which had never been succinctly defined, but which simply inhabits the area of human life <coughs> that has been reserved for poetry, filling it as an atmosphere, there could be no poetry, no poets. The consciousness of poets is infused with it, even if they do not seriously subscribe to it. All have to subscribe to it, formally, ritualistically. Profession of creed is implicit in the assumption of poet identity. The reason why there has been this combination of a purely spiritual intention with a literary objective is that the intention has never yet had a natural home in customary human behavior and has taken what home it could get. It's having an official home in poetry is the closest it has come to having a natural home. Supposedly in poetry, human beings, poets and others with them succeed spiritually, succeed for the while of the poem. They enjoy sensations of knowing perfection in a unity of perfect feeling and perfect thought in perfect word. The poetic experience seeming to raise the self, not out of itself, as the pattern of religious experience promotes, but to a final fullness of human personality. Everywhere else, the human being seems, in, in the final sense, to fail personally. In poetry, there is at least an immediate imagination of the task of personal attainment to highest spiritual success. The odor of poetry suggests an aroma of immortal truth, humanly spoken. It excites a feel of the ultimate virtue throbbing in the words. Such, all in one, is the conventional character, the literary pattern, the spiritual theory of poetry. The public and its poem providers tend to strike a tacit bargain by which they, as in mutual courtesy, ignore what is reciprocally... Uh, I beg your pardon, I, I've skipped a paragraph. Poets can, by the allowance of poetic craft, exert fascinations upon the oral and visual imagination of readers, listeners, that transfix them permanently in certain orders of ideas and emotions. Generations of readers, nations in their centuries, can be held fixed by the potency of the verbal arts of poets exuberant in the poetic leave given them, or that they take to be given, to work with words as physically wieldable tools upon others. In exerting such influence, poets exaggerate, exaggerate the weaknesses of poetry. They become locked in impotent acceptance of a relationship to the others, the readers, etc., <clears throat> that makes the others slavish attendants, where their role is theoretically that of vigorously responsive participants in the poetic act of utterance. The exaggeration is a vulgarization of the weaknesses, but the exaggerative force employed can make the qualities of the results seem qualities of poetic strength. The public and its poems providers tend to strike a tacit bargain by which they, as in mutual courtesy, ignore what is reciprocally demeaning in their relationship. There are many examples of this indulgence of poets under the sanction of emotional custom in hypnotic verbalistic power play, and there is much variety in the examples. A very respectable example is that of Shakespeare. There is a contradictoriness of levels in poetry from which there is no escape between the level of sensuous susceptibility on which the physical word enchantment is worked and the level of spiritual liberation, which the very words that make the enchantment are in meaning supposed to realize. In offering a refuge to human beings where they can put off the narrow identity of physical being and classified identity of social being, and assume the broad and open identity of the state of being in which the person is the soul. Poetry is spiritually anomalous in that its major ministrations are to the physical person. The spiritual person is indeed only symbolically provided for in poetry through the physical person as representing it. The part of creed in poetry 
makes devotion to it as devotion to a cause. But it has no continuity except in subscription to creed. There is, has been, no development in it of achievement on the basis of creed. It amounts practically to nothing more than a cultural activity, that is, a token activity in which certain faculties are exercised but not fulfilled. These are faculties of sensitivity to the possibility harbored in words of realizing in them the ultimate spiritually complete articulateness. Poetic creed makes the possibility the atmosphere of poetic utterance, but poetic craft stops in the excitation of expectancies of spiritual events in the form of word utterances. Actually, the words cultivate sensations of expectancy rather than precipitate themselves become spiritual events. Thus it happens that the summum bonum of the poetic creed resolves itself in experience into a satisfaction of equating sensuously pleasurable word effects with actualities of successful spiritual articulateness. Poetry serves literary criticism as a field of linguistic connoisseurship and is comfortable in the room it holds for educated appreciation of linguistic expertness to the arts that make direct appeal to the senses and yet swell into large fields for connoisseurship on an elevated intellectual plane. But this aspect of the experience of poetry is a parasitic form of appreciation, having no relation to poetry as it organically and idiosyncratically is, only to poetry as literature par excellence. Almost all professional poetry criticism has its seat in the field of linguistic connoisseurship and is mainly the criticism of the peculiar linguistic sophistication of poets that crowds ghostily round their poems and works its way mutely into every emptiness in them in which, under the name of artistic discretion, the continual failure to say of poetry hides itself. Not only has there been no tradition of evaluating poetry according to how poets adjudicate in their poems between the demands of creed and those of craft, and how generally they fulfill the spiritual function that poetry is committed to fulfill. The very writing of poetry has been to a large extent orientated to the values of such critical connoisseurship. Indeed, there are poets who write their poems from within this connoisseur field combining there the office of poet and that of critic, and turning from one to the other with little alteration of mental focus. T.S. Eliot was entirely an inhabitant of the connoisseur realm, as critic and poet both. The difference between the poet who does service to poetry, incidentally to doing service to literature, and the poet having a direct allegiance to poetry is in the matter of ingenuousness. The former is conscientiously disingenuous, professionally sincere, because consciously so. The trimming of poetic creed to the limitations of literary interest is done under auspices having a piety of its own, that of contributing to public sophistication. On the other hand, poets who try to be loyal to the creed are bound to be martyrs to their ingenuousness, martyrs to the extent to which they succeed in being, in remaining ingenuous. The more ingenuously poet poets are, the more at a disadvantage they will be <clears throat> with the critical connoisseurship and with the public that takes its cues from the critical connoisseurship and most of all with themselves. They will not be satisfied ever with themselves as poets. Critics of the practical-minded order have become increasingly sensitive to the exposure of poetry to the danger of being pressed by the devoutly serious nature of poet poetic spirituality into the area of religious emotionalism. The very nerve in poetry of quickness to the dilemma of having a definable literary function and a literarily unplaceable human commitment to spiritual purification of motive and end in the personally expressive use of words is deliberately deadened in the devoutly humanistic scrupulosity of the doctors of modern literary criticism who deal with poetry's contradictions by treating them 
as conditions natural to a human enterprise. The trend in the, contempor in the contemporary criticism of poetry is towards the realistic conception of the spiritual plane of poetic activity. It must not be religious in spiritual degree, although it may be religious, religios, in extent of use of religious imagery for dramatic enlivenment of poetry as a stage for literary performance. To myself, that criticism of poetry, which does not face the necessity of answering questions, or at least posing questions, as questions of prime interest on the kinship of poetry and religion, as verging upon each other in identity of intellectual location, is a despriser of the spiritual intention animating both poetry and religion in their aspects of intellectual sincerity. Both issue from human thought at the same point, and both round back to that point, poetry taking an experimental path of personal responsibility for truth, religion taking a path of reliance for truth on chosen authority. Both call for treatment as intellectual alternatives in spiritual experiment. A spiritual criticism of poetry, a criticism intent on going all the way in judgment, must have the company of an entirely unbiased, truly linguistic criticism of it. Engaged in by poets themselves, spiritually motivated linguistic criticism, evaluation of workmanship in which there is sustained resolution against indulgence of linguistically insufficient or unfaithful word use, must lead to a crisis of choice between the necessities of poetic craft and the requirements of poetic creed in which the code of truth of word is implicit to its very core. And so long as commitment to creed holds, even the most ingenuous of poets will strain their ingenuousness towards the breaking point of disingenuous to justify disingenuousness, to justify their spiritual to their spiritual conscience the shadings in their linguistic sense of honor that the very exercise of the craft with its relentless insistence on physical potency of word imposes. In fact, we cannot have perfectly enlightened linguistic criticism of poetry except where commitment to creed has finally taken the poet outside of poetry. Commitment to that end of pure speaking and therefore a pure being <coughs> that has worn <coughs> the accoutrements of poetry in order to win itself a place in the human world. The hardest straining to make the words of a poem both right in truth and right in verbal poetics cannot produce continuous unity in these conditions. The poem is in a constant state of having to be kept from coming apart. The labor of reinforcement, repair, depending on the extent <coughs> to which the poet is of ingenuous conscience in the poet role. I am speaking of poets <coughs> in which there is some happy animation with cr poems, in which there is some happy animation with creed, and solemn concern with verbal integrity of statement, beyond the professional honor of craft concern, which is more sensitive to standards of verbal seemliness than to those of linguistic probity. <laughs> the poetic literature of the connoisseurship, poetry not as an area of spiritual endeavor, but as the material cultural inheritance of poems, becomes endowed with hierarchical significances of value to which poets attune themselves in making their poems conceived as additions to the literary cultural poetry mass. The newcomer poets present themselves as dedicated to the sustaining of the linguistic commitments embodied in the historical quantity poetry, while ringing to the confusion of general perception of what these were, confusions of changes on the established standards of linguistic the linguistic superior as exemplifiable in poetry. <coughs>
the straining of poets and the literary connoisseurship's sponsors of poetry to support poetry's antique prestige as the site of attainment to virtuously valuable elegance of language has been steadily diminishing as a self-cohering <coughs> element in the contemporary production of poetic literature, poet, po poetry criticism included. It may be said <coughs> with a reasonable effect of historical accuracy, I think, that it is only now the effete literary linguistic educatedness of a pseudo-aristocracy of practicing poets combined with <clears throat> the energetic professional purpose purposiveness of the surviving remnants of a once substantial body of critical connoisseurs that keeps poetry existent in a state of formal honoredness. Some poets adopt a posture of treasuring language, manifest an urbane consciousness, an urbane self-consciousness, in the employment of it as the professional instrument of poets. And the poem texts of these will show the trappings of linguistic sagacity. Their linguistic behavior will be within the bounds of literary critical conceptions of poetic linguistic decorum. But this is all a parade irreverent of the honored subject poetry. The paraders are doing honor to themselves. Creed has come to consist in but the precautions of a freely vague literary honesty in the connoisseurship province of poetry, the effect being of a stigial respect paying to it as the crux of the existence of poetry. And craft pressure, pressure has been modified to allow of shifts from meeting exigencies of verbal artistry to the functioning of craft as an endlessly variable management of poetic linguistic style. Straining between the requirements of creed and those of craft has degenerated into a mock struggle. Poetry as a perennial actuality began losing its survival vitality in the first half of this century. It is to what it is to them largely a fiction. It is to what is to them largely a fiction that poets and critics in this time conform in their efforts to identify themselves with the historic dignity of poetry. I now turn to read some chosen passages from the last chapter of a book on language, not yet published, of the title Rational Meaning, a New Foundation for the Definition of Words, by myself and my husband, Skylar B. Jackson, a work of many years, continued by me to completion after he died in 1968. The title of the chapter is The Grand Difficulty. The difficulty in question, then, as to the cleansing of their being by human beings through a cleansing of their linguistic procedures is that of a reinforcing of one another in a comprehensive purifying of identity of dedication through action performed within the limits of personal scrupulosity. How can such a general attainment of identity of purpose and doing come about without anyone's moving from his, her personal ground? Only by faithful care of the personal ground will its n nature as of common ground be known. The whole human inheritance is nowhere but in each. Only by love of the same thing by all, from the place of the mind of each, and from the outspread situation of the feelings of each under the mind's watch, only by total verification, reinforcement entire by itself, of a unity of single dedications, unreduced by contractions of individual ground into scattered sections of human life, can the difficulty of human explicit division and diversity teeming within an implicit, necessary, fated, and to intractable self-separation, 
last separation, fatal, ultimate oneness of life sense be explicitly overpassed. Only when the same thing is truth to all understanding can the difficulty be forever or ever and ever overpassed. For if it is not that, if it is varyingly something else, or something else called that, there can be only a human shifting from one objective, <laughs> ideal, or dedication to another. For truth alone encompasses containingly all happily conceived human aspiration. All human beings, in their capacity as individual possessors of their language and users of it upon a personal ground of potential competence to use it well, should be looked to to speak there and from there their own understanding of their being and of the world in which it has being. Insofar as they have not as a whole risen to the full of this potential, some have always risen among them to a partial realization of the potential above the, gra the general level of realization of it. These superior competencies of mind and word <coughs> have brought it about that the generality have been led forth to varying extents along different paths and in different directions from their backward places. But they have also been misled. The paths errant or coming to false stops because the competency of those of better understanding was not complete, was short of the human full. In these times which have to all sensibilities, differently according to the differing personal nature of people, a feeling of finality, emphasis upon the individual human being as the prime unit of human life is politically, sociologically, philosophically widespread. Even the totalitarian political regimes postulate an essential type of individual human being, the good of whom they evoke <coughs> as the reason of their system. But even in the better than nominally democratic, politically collective units of human life, an informal collectivistic intellectual government surrounds everywhere the individual personal ground. And the more literally democratic the political regime, the more vigorously active, the more imperious is this other government, taking its charter of educative authority from the presiding political philosophy of protective benevolence towards an inner authority of individual mind and word viewed as lodged within the boundaries of personal ground as within a sacred enclosure. The individual human being in these times, in the most democratic of intellectual atmospheres, finds himself or herself propagandized with ex exhortative emphasis upon self-conscious individuality in thought, expression of it, and act. But under the general regime of such finalistic human sophistication about human life, the human individual being is more tightly imprisoned within the instructions of those of the recognized higher ranges of competency of understanding than the individual human being of all preceding times. No human beings of other times have been so much fettered as the contemporary ones with compliments to their integrity of individual human realness, and at once so much subjected to educative assault upon their theoretically sovereign rights to cultivate themselves their individual ground of general understanding and self-understanding. Defensive resistance to the cultural faculty of publicly massed forces of com compartmentalized modern wisdom law presents intricately baffling difficulties to human beings in their sensitivity to their responsibility to themselves and their human fellows to develop their competencies of action of mind and word as originating within themselves and to be nurtured upon their own personal ground. The writers lead the army of cultural intellectualism. They carry the language with them, or what seems to be the language. It is a version of the language adapted to the new co compartmental principle of human understanding, the new wisdom fashions. The language they carry is the tangible evidence of their intellectual righteousness, the object of their professional solicitude and moral concern in behalf of the linguistic happiness of all, is a careless version of the language of all. It abandons the intellectual principles of language and the linguistic principles of literature and leaves the field of intellectual and literary as well as linguistic criticism to the academical army in the rear 
to the besieged ground on which is lived or should be lived the private life of the intelligence, the personally possessed ground of mind and word, contemporary literature brings its language as a peace offering, an instrument of truce or argument of inevitable conquest. Give in, give in, it urges. Come over to the side of the modern mind. The people, one might say, we the people have thus had the skies of their intellectual time filmed over with the wastes of humanly unreal intellectual production. Through the film, individual human beings can know the sunlight of their minds only as a hazed over, strange, scarcely identifiable illumination, and the stars of their endeavours of distinction of thought only as dulled or quite invisible presences in the night expanse of their intellectual anticipations of themselves. When too much history has been made in earthly physical time and public intellectual time, the time has come to withdraw from the scenes of alarm to the mind's individual private ground. Language will come along. It will be that by which one withdraws. It will be that by which one is of the general human competency that provides the people's wisdom, the method, the means, the very substance of universal mutuality. What Thucydides wrote of the derangement of human senses of value in Corsaira during its revolution in the course of the Peloponnesian War, the horrors committed there by these ones against those ones, others against other ones in spreading progression, a tangled chain of atrocity, the places at which revolution arrived last from having heard what had been done before, carrying it to a still greater excess to a still greater excess, the refinement of their invention as manifested in the cunning of their enterprises and the atrocity of their reprisals has retained its sting all through the following ages of centuries. Who of those who nod intellectual recognition of the applicability of what he wrote to human behavior in general under stresses of fear, suspicion, greed of power, so long as the nature of manhood remains the same, as Thucydides himself said, Many of those later ones, however, with complacency of historical sagacity, believing that it likely will always remain the same, do not or would not extend the nodding to what he wrote on words in that unveiling of the Corsarian deliberate madness to all who might care in an any time to look. Words had to change their ordinary meaning and to take that which was now given them. Reckless audacity came to be considered the courage of a loyal ally. Prudent hesitation, specious cowardice. Moderation was held to be a cloak for unmanliness, etc. But who are those who nod in sad comprehension of how it must have been with the speech of the Corsarians? Will not have reservations as to words and what and how words mean acquired from the new linguistical philosophies and the general scientifically modernized <clears throat> intellectual attitudes of the time comfortably placed in their minds to cushion them against just such horror as what Thucydides told of on the state of word use in the time of the Corthorean revolutionary nightmare might excite if taken in without sophisticated protection. Who of the nodding ones will not divide the sense of horror that what Thucydides wrote cannot but at least momentarily evoke insofar as the matter of word use is concerned, into two parts, one issuing in the sighing thought, ah, how familiar that I this is, the other issuing in the comment, but of course we know that in any case language is always changing, that in any case words do not have ordinary meanings in the sense of stable meanings, uniform in the minds of all their users. Words mean, goes this reasoning, according to their context, and not only are context ever different, but concepts arise in certain influential contexts that take possession of words, having some loosely constant ingredients of meaning and altogether transform their meanings for a time until new conceptual appropriators of words spring up in new, more influential contexts and new transformations of meanings occur 
And so the scene shifts to considerations of over 2,000 years later of the nature of human nature and of the nature of that which is the most sensitive representative of human nature, that is, language in its practical reality as words. If human beings were to rely on context for bearings in their understanding of the meanings of words, <clears throat> in their own use of them and others' use of them, and on the concepts that made words nothing distinct, nothing definite in themselves, they would eliminate themselves as humanity, separated from the mental base actuality of language, um, dementalized without words that are words, words that mean what they mean, as the language of their human nativity provides, minds have no <coughs> guardians of their sanity. From the earliest manifestations of the scientific movement in language study, the subjection of language to a scientific standoff to see the better method of evaluation and understanding, words, words as entities of meaning, have been progressively lost sight of as it were, without the leave of the people, various schools of new modern intellectualism in their different ways deverbalized language, minimized its word content, evaluated it as a behavior system in its general manifestations and as a mechanism of adjunctive convenience in the conduct of professional intellectual processes, as it were, non-essential, but there. This deverbalizing treatment of language has not destroyed the words of the speaking generality, but it has utterly removed stimulus to word consciousness that formerly penetrated to the general human areas of conscious life <coughs> from quarters harboring special forms of intellectual self-consciousness and most substantially from literary and other quarters of public address. Nowhere, no one anywhere is using words with confidence in what they are using as words. <coughs> in literary and other public address use, Personalistic self-confidence is the center of verbal dynamics. In the ordinary course of word use, people adhere to a general policy of diffidence towards assuming that any single particular word of theirs can have importance. Common discourse, spoken or written, is habitually loose, easily both brisk and gentle, relaxed and nervously hurried, patternless and yet greatly repetitive in forms of expression, cast of sentences. Verbal utterance is a flow of words rather than a structure of words. Insofar as the words possess in, any, in use any substantiality of meaning, they immediately get lost from minds until, at need, they are found again. A good deal of human sense is allowed to slip away in the varied theories of meaning put forth by the proponents of scientific interpretation of the nature of language, from the inventors of logical positivism with their empiricist criterion of meaning and their refusal to recognize anything but mathematical and empirical statements as meaningful, to the ruminations of the explorers of the potentialities of semiotics as a universal analytic science philosophy of concepts of meaning, meaning conceived of by these as both linguistic meaning and what they call non-linguistic meaning. All who think, who know the process of putting their minds to work, or it could be said of their minds putting themselves to work, know what they mean, what they know that they think with meanings. There is no other way of thinking. And the meanings with which they think are not other than what the physically utterable words which, with which they speak have. And any differentiation between linguistic and non-linguistic meaning delanguages the mind, and it is mistaken then to talk of meaning. The mind knows the meanings with which it thinks with a life quickness not habitually, indeed, but rarely equaled in the consciousness of meaning with which a word is spoken. But there is no natural gap between the mind's knowing and the speaking person's consciousness. The mind ought to be immediately, even instantly, there to one, to turn to for one's full understanding of one's words. In the long human course, mind and speaking person have undergone separations of different kinds and degrees. Grave is the present state of human beings. The history of these separations rests upon them. Up to the recent age, they have had a character of collective intellectual fault, the responsibility distributively divided, the individual human being guilty only of an involuntary stupidity. <coughs> 
the individual human being is no longer a child of history. Human beings generally have attained to a self-educatability in themselves. They have always known themselves as knowable. This is the mark of humanity. The difficulty has been how to go about the knowing and how short to be of what is thought known. The mounted up obscurities have worn to flatness. The tracks of inquiry have crisscrossed and tangled until all leads now fast back to themselves. <clears throat> they stand in the center of a clear field of capability of knowing themselves. The actual difficulty, a formally, collectively frightening one, but personally, individually, a grand difficulty of knowing what is theirs to know. Knowing the meanings of their words is the beginning of explicit wisdom of themselves. To the extent of the acceptance As to the failure of human beings to fulfill to grand sufficiency their capability of knowing themselves, we see all as individually culpable now in the generally existing insufficiency in the knowledge of what they are. We also see a special culpability in those who have created language sciences and related mind sciences. To the extent of the acceptance and influence of these, their progenitors and proponents perform a surgery upon the human sense of self of prying apart mind and speaking person's consciousness to the closest possible approach to severance. But all separation of people from their minds, even that of such way out objectivity, is reversible by them. In the case of knowledge of the meanings of words, one is at the heart of the human knowledge experience. We believe this order of knowledge to be the mind's intrinsic scheme of knowledge, the uniform method of all knowledge processes. If this be so, the better people know the meanings of their words, the better they will know how to know that which is to be known. And if it be so, all is mystery without language. And linguistic meaning, as some oddly call the meanings that words have in their languages, is the initiation into the unknown that is also knowable. The rights of language in their entirety are the rights of knowledge that should meet all the exactions of mystery. <laughs>